Good evening. If we could uh, take our seats now. So we've got some big delegations here. I'd like, I'd like to welcome um, the Norwegian Tunneling Society, who are on, a, on the grand tour of um, the British Isles. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome a big delegation for Heron Connect on the back row there. Um, I, thought, I thought you were busy writing your story, Dickie. You've been telling me that for the last month, and I haven't seen anything yet. Um, any other big delegate? Well, Warwick University. Where's Warwick University? Yeah, well, we've got one from Warwick University, right? Okay, well, one's better than none. We've got some from Ferrovial. Yeah, I see Ferrovial up there somewhere. So, Happy New Year to all of you. And Robbins. Um, uh, two, 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 um, uh, a very brief um, um, biographical notes for our two speakers tonight. Um, and Catherine Callagher. Um, was a uh, client lead on the follow line, a uh, 20, 20 kilometer long tunnel, and was instrumental in, um, in developing the TBM solution um, for this tunnel, um, and swimming against the tide in Norway, I think, um, for, for, for that solution, and is current uh, president of the Norwegian Tunneling um, Society. And um, I apologize for my Norwegian not being quite right. Iren Grove. Very close. Close enough. Um, close enough. And I'm sure you'll tell us the correct pronunciation when you get up there. Um, professor, Technical University in Norway, um, former president of the Norwegian Tunneling Society, and former vice president of uh, the ITA. Um, the floor is yours. Yeah, Th thank you so much for uh, the introduction. And uh, on behalf of Norwegian Tunneling Society, uh, I will say that we are honored being here today in this impressive uh, building. Uh, I will uh, just give you a short introduction uh, uh, about, about uh, Norwegian Tunneling Society. Uh, and uh, we have a motto where um, which says that if you have surface, uh, surface challenges, uh, try underground solutions. And we have a vision uh, which says that the most important knowledge sharing area uh, of, uh, you, you, for use of the bedrock. And then we have some values uh, for what we are doing and what we are doing shall be based on knowledge, enthusiasm and commitment. And our goals says that uh, uh, we want to have an industry that are safe and environmental friendly, and uh, an industry that is attractive and visible, and also an industry that is uh, viable, innovative, and knowledge-based. And to fulfill this, we have some focus areas. And um, first, we, uh, we uh, are working for strengthening safety and health and reduced environmental impact uh, during the performance of projects. And we want to promote sustainable exploration uh, of the bedrock and also contribute to innovation in the industry. Uh, recruit, educate, and develop uh, new uh, members of the Tunneling Society is also one of our main focus areas. And uh, last but not least, strengthen knowledge sharing and cooperation both nationally and internationally. And um, the board consists of um, nine members and uh, many of us are here today. And we are organized uh, with the board, and then we have um, four different committees, and the board members, they are uh, 
either in charge of one of these committees or they are members of, of the committee. And the board represents the entire uh, industry, mirrors the entire industry, uh, with representatives from uh, the engineering companies, vendors, contractors, clients, uh, and uh, academia. And we are um, working uh, with um, different uh, handbooks. And uh, for the moment, we have a handbook for use of bolts, technical report about uh, uh, using bolts and shot creek from uh, uh, an open TBM, handbook for rock blasters and digitalization in uh, the tunneling. And the last one is, um, is something uh, we are uh, spending a lot of energy on because uh, uh, using uh, 3D models uh, is uh, something that will really improve uh, the performance of our future uh, projects. Absolutely. And uh, then we have um, a lot of uh, activities uh, on the agenda as well, uh, which has not uh, really started up yet, but uh, it will. But I think I will uh, continue uh, with uh, the rest of the presentation, which will be about uh, Norwegian ground conditions and uh, also uh, uh, an uh, introduction to new upcoming tunnel projects in the city of Oslo, urban tunnel pro projects. And first, I will pay attention to uh, some specific ground conditions that has to be taken into account when we are performing uh, tunnel projects in Norway. It's about the hardness of the rock. Uh, earlier I didn't think that was uh, something special, but uh, I have learned, because we also cooperate with uh, with contractors uh, from the southern part of Europe, for instance, and uh, I have learned that uh, uh, what we call hard rock uh, is not uh, the same as uh, they call hard rock. They have told me that uh, what we call hard rock is, uh, they, they would define it as extreme hard rock conditions. So, okay. <laughs> but but uh, it is, uh, normally we have uh, performed uh, most of our tunnels by conventional drill and blast, and uh, then uh, the hard rock is uh, very suitable for... Um, for performance of tunnels by conventional drill and blast. But now we have also, as uh, told in, uh, in the introduction, we have also uh, uh, started to perform tunnels uh, by uh, tunnel boring machines. We did it uh, uh, for a while, uh, back in the 1970s, 80s and 90s for hydropower projects, but then it has been quiet for uh, a long time. Um, another uh, topic uh, is uh, water balance and the relationship between leakages and settlements. That is important when we are performing tunnels uh, in Norway. And uh, then I have a question. Are you familiar with uh, quick clay and how to handle a quick clay? Some of you, but not all. I will say something about that also. Uh, and then um, I will uh, give you... Uh, short introduction to some new upcoming tunnel projects in the city of Oslo afterwards. First, uh, what, what kind of rock conditions do we actually have to deal with in Norway? Uh, we have different kinds of, of rock, uh, crystalline basement, uh, mainly uh, of Precambrian age, uh, various glazes and granites and fibrolates with uh, a uni uh, actual uh, uh, compressive strength of yeah, varies between 100 and up to 300 megapascals. Uh, and then we also have some sedimentary rock uh, of uh, Cumbrian Silurian age, uh, chalk, sandstone, siltstone, but also hornfells, which can be quite hard. Mm -hmm different kinds of shales, uh, and then we have variations from 30, and actually, if we also um, take the horn fills into account, up to 300 megapascal. Uh, and then we have some intrusive rocks of uh, carbon and Permian age, uh, 
also within the same range, 100 up to 300 megapascals. But as I said, for uh, conventional drill and blast, this rock types is excellent. Uh, and then we have um, um, uh, fractures and leakages, settlements, and the connection between this. Uh, the rock mass itself is a general um, uh, impermeable. It's competent uh, and uh, uh, with little up to moderate jointing. Uh, but in some areas we have fractures and we have groups of, of fractures. And um, during several glacier periods, this uh, rock surface has been exposed to erosion. And the uh, areas with uh, no fractures have been uh, less is, uh, exposed to erosion uh, than areas with, uh, with uh, a lot of uh, fractures. So then we have peaks and we have valleys. And after the last glacier period, 10,000 years ago, uh, many of these valleys were filled with uh, marine sediments, ma mainly clay. And um, this is something we have to take into account and because these um, uh, fracture zones uh, in the bottom of these valleys filled with marine sediments, when the tunnel uh, are intersecting these um, uh, fractures, they may act as drainage channels. Uh, and, um, and then we will have settlements uh, on buildings uh, founded on top of this, uh, in many areas, large packages of, of clay. And um, at the follow line project, uh, which I'm responsible, where I'm responsible for the tunnel part, uh, we um, identified a number of fracture zones um, before we entered into the contract. And on this picture, you can see the black lines, that is uh, uh, fracture zones with a thickness of one meter or more. And um, the tunnel are at different angles uh, crossing these fracture zones, and the fracture zones itself, they span from being more or less vertical to nearly horizontal. Uh, but uh, the fact is that these fracture zones, they are also connected to each other. So when we are intersecting one fracture zone, we may have an influence uh, 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 over a quite large area, and we may have a, a, leak, uh, a reduction of the pore pressure in the clay within a large area. Here, for instance, when the tunnel is crossing this fracture zone, we may affect a quite large area. Uh, and if we don't do anything with the leakage in that area, uh, we will, after a while, have settlements on buildings on top of, uh, uh, of these valleys or packages of, of clay. And then we are entering into the next uh, um, uh, fracture, fracture and uh, the next and the next, and the same will happen again within the same influence area. And then, uh, when we are entering into the next um, uh, system of uh, fractures, you will have the same. So, so to, to stop or at least limit these leakages every time you are entering into the fracture zone is uh, one of the keys to success when you are performing tunnels uh, in uh, Norway and in those areas where we have this combination with thick layers of clay and uh, fracture zones. So, yeah, water balance, we, we uh, often uh, uh, raise the question, are we going to, to uh, perform a drained or an undrained tunnel? And when we are performing tunnels by conventional drill and blast, we are no normally uh, excavating a, a drained uh, tunnel solution. Uh, and then we also have to, to study how much leakages can be uh, accepted. Uh, and um, if we look at this uh, illustration, for instance, we have some requirements and we have buildings on top of uh, the sediments. You can see uh, are filling this valley. And we have a fracture zone in the bottom of the valley. And um, 
Um, we are not allowed to, to lower the pore pressure because we want to, to avoid settlements uh, of buildings uh, on top of, uh, of these uh, uh, thick layers of, of clay. So when we are performing the tunnel, we, we have some mitigations and then we are doing systematic uh, pre-grafting until we have control of the water. Uh, and we are, of course, doing the same when we are opening up cross passages, is if we are going to have uh, cross passages. Uh, and more or less uh, the same when we, um, if we have an undrained solution, uh, we are uh, using, um, uh, we are doing pre grafting when we are entering into these zones, but uh, since we then uh, install a watertight lining shortly behind uh, the cutter head or, or the shield of the machine, uh, if we are forming this with a TBM, uh, then we um, uh, don't have to stop the leakages completely, but we have to reduce the, um, the amount of, uh, of leakage. So then we are doing a backfill to stabilize the ring and also to prevent water to, to flow um, uh, behind the lining. And uh, of course, contact grafting and pre-grafting when we are opening up for a CPs as well. Uh, so that was enough of, about um, water and water balance. And then we have quick clay. Uh, and uh, quick clay, it's clay which is depos deposited uh, within a marine, uh, a marine uh, uh, environment in the ocean. And um, it, the clay uh, fragments, they are uh, deposited as an open structure and in between all the clay uh, fragments, there are salt, or it used to be salt. Uh, but after 10,000 years, the, the, the salt or much of the salt have been washed out. So the salt have, have acted as a kind of reinforcement for this structure. And now the structure have lost uh, the reinforcement and it has become unstable. And can you imagine a house of cards? If you make some vibrations or if you take out one of the cards, then you will have a collapse and it happens like this, suddenly. And that's what happens uh, when you are disturbing quick clay as well. And quick clay is something we have uh, many places in the Oslo area. And this is something we have to, to be aware of and uh, make uh, necessary preparations uh, for before we are entering into to this uh, clay. And um, I have um, a movie uh, made uh, by the Norwegian Geotechnical uh, Institute. We have uh, some of our members. Uh, uh, um, of um, NFF um, uh, who are here today. They uh, are working at uh, NGI. Uh, and um, here you can see a quick clay which is loaded and it becomes uh, fluent as you will see here. It, it was firm but now it uh, is more like, like a soup. And um, what can we do to make this clay stable again? <laughs> yeah, we can add salt or chalk cement piles, which we normally do. In, uh, install salt, salt um, chalk cement piles, mix them into the clay, and then the clay becomes firm again, stable. So that is solution, but it is in many ways magic. <laughs> um, and we have actually have had uh, a huge number of quick clay slides in Norway during the history. Uh, I won't go into details about all of them, but uh, I will highlight uh, one of them. 
the research slide up uh, in uh, not far from uh, Trondheim back in 1978, eight, where six million um, uh, cubic meters of clay within an area of 330,000 square meters were transformed to a liquid soup. And one person unfortunately died, and more than 20 buildings were destroyed. And the slide also created uh, a three meter high tidal wave in the nearby lake. And um, this uh, was uh, uh, what started the slide. Uh, a farmer, he wanted to extend uh, the size of his barn and he did some, uh, some um, excavation. Uh, and then he disturbed the clay nearby the lake. Uh, and if we look at um, this movie, it's also produced by uh, Norwegian um, uh, Geotechnical Institute. You can see what, what happened. He started a slide, but the farm uh, where um, uh, it started was not affected. The buildings on that farm was not affected. But more than 20 buildings uh, nearby were affected. And this is a movie from, from the slide. And you can see the edge of the slide splashing into uh, the river of clay. It's not water, it's a river of clay. You can see total fluent. And here, a farm is uh, floating down this river of clay. It's quite dramatic. Yeah, you can see it's splashing and yeah. So enough about the quick clay. Um, then we have on the agenda uh, a number of new tunnels which will be built under Oslo. We already have some tunnels, not as many as uh, you have in London, but we have some tunnels, a railway tunnel and uh, a metro tunnel and some other uh, tunnels. But uh, now we are going to build a new railway tunnel uh, through Oslo, uh, a new metro line, which will connect uh, some of the other existing metro lines. We'll build a, build a new, that is also a metro line, uh, the Fornebu line and um, uh, tunnels for water supply to, to Oslo and also uh, some tunnels uh, for cables. And uh, this is a map uh, of uh, the city of uh, Oslo, downtown Oslo. Uh, Oslo Central Station is located here. And we have the National uh, Theatre Station. Uh, and uh, Sköjen, Lysaker, Bislet, uh, because I will, you will see those names uh, on the map for the metro lines as well. But in, within this area, a lot of things will, will happen uh, in the coming, coming years, when we start to build all these tunnels. Um, some of them are uh, nearly ready to start, but uh, others are more uh, on the planning, uh, in the planning phase, uh, still on, in the planning phase. And this is a, a map of, uh, of uh, the metro lines, where um, uh, the dotted lines uh, will be new, new metro lines, which will, which will connect the existing ones. Uh, and Järnbanetorv uh, is the same as uh, Oslo S or the, the, the main railway station in, uh, in Oslo. And then we have National Theatre Station, Majorstuen and Bislet. And uh, this map uh, shows the same lines uh, but uh, uh, printed on, on a real, real map and you can see that uh, uh, the tunnels will um, pass under densely populated areas where we have all these um, uh, ground conditions which, which I have al uh, already introduced you for. Uh, and um, 
Then we have the Fornebu line, uh, Ruth Haug, she is in charge of, uh, of that um, project. Uh, a new eight kilometer long metro line from uh, Majorstuen. Uh, that was, um, you saw that uh, on the, uh, the map uh, over the other metro lines. Uh, but this is a brand new line, which uh, uh, eight kilometer long with a 6.6 .6 kilometer long tunnel. And uh, they will also build uh, six new underground stations on this line and within densely populated urban areas. Uh, and then we have um, uh, a new water supply uh, for um, Oslo. Um, some part of this project uh, will be performed uh, outside the city. Uh, for instance, this 19 kilometer long tunnel, which will be uh, excavated by uh, tunnel boring machines. Uh, but uh, then, uh, close to the city, uh, we will build a new water uh, 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 yeah, treatment plant and uh, also um, tunnels uh, uh, for the, the, the distribution of, uh, of the water, drinking water. Uh, and then we have uh, new tunnels for cables, which will also be... Um, uh, performed uh, in, in uh, quite close to the city of, uh, of Oslo. So a lot of activity will take place in uh, the central Oslo area uh, the coming years. And uh, this project they have already started. Uh, and uh, I mentioned the water supply project. They, they uh, will uh, uh, send out the invitation for tender uh, quite soon. Uh, and uh, the metro line and uh, the, the railway line is still in the planning phase. Uh, but uh, the Fornebu line route uh, is... Uh, yes. This year, start construction. So, um, yeah. And um, there are some challenges regarding all these new tunnels. One thing is the, the ground conditions, as I said. This, on this map, you can see um, with different colors how the, the depth down to the bedrock. Uh, and uh, those red areas, there are uh, more than 40 meters down. And you have these valleys. And these valleys are uh, more or less filled with soft clay and many of the areas uh, we also have quick clay. So the clay has to be stabilized in many of these areas, but also the orange areas, uh, we have uh, yeah, more than 20 meter uh, down to, to the bedrock and soft clay above. And we are crossing many of these valleys uh, with our tunnels. Um, and for railroad tunnels, for instance, it is difficult to, to locate them deep because they are going to have a connection to Oslo Central Station, for instance. So, um, yeah, there are some challenges. And we also have, um, yeah, uh, different kinds of underground infrastructure. Um, in some areas, it's quite crowded down there. Um, and... Uh, what we also have is a, a huge number, an unknown number of energy wells, uh, which we also have to, to register before we, uh, we start performing the tunnels. So what we would like to have is an um, underground master plan, where we have an uh, overview of all the installation and also all the planned uh, installations in the underground. We don't have it uh, yet, but uh, hopefully uh, it will be developed, uh, developed within a few years. And um, the question is, uh, are uh, our underground uh, conditions uh, showstoppers for new tunnels under Oslo? And the answer is definitely no. But it is important that we, we uh, know how to handle them. To have a good knowledge and understanding of the ground conditions is uh, a 
very important key to success, good knowledge, and also experience uh, of suitable mitigations. If you have quick care, for instance, do you know how to handle it? How do you know how to stabilize it before you are uh, 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 entering into those areas with uh, tunnels? Uh, and uh, also follow up and uh, measure the pore pressure continuously, that is important. And last but not least, um, maybe one of, the, one of the most important tools we have when we are performing a project, the communication tool. Com good communication with the neighbors ahead uh, of the uh, startup of the project, but also during the entire construction period. Uh, due to my experience, it is really important. Um, and what kind of tools do we have for the excavation of our new tunnels? Until recently, you know, we have uh, uh, done the majority of our tunnels in Norway by conventional drill and blast methodology. And the, the rock conditions are very suitable for, uh, for uh, uh, the excavation by... Uh, uh, drill and blast as well. But we have some projects where we have, uh, which we have uh, uh, performed the tunnels uh, by using um, uh, tunnel boring machines. Uh, back in the past, hydropower projects, but, uh, but now we have also reintroduced this method uh, uh, for um, the excavation of uh, two railway tunnels. Uh, and uh, then, in very sensitive areas, we have also uh, made some experiments by uh, doing the excavation by a drill and split methodology. And when we are splitting, we are boring a grid of holes, uh, 450 to 500 holes within a cross-section of approximately 70 square meter. And then we are using a hydraulic wedge and breaking the rock into pieces. It's a very slow excavation method, half a meter each day, but if we start early enough, enough uh, it, is, um, it may be suitable in some areas. So, as I said, we have uh, long traditions by uh, performing tunnels by conventional drill and blast in Norway. And I think we will continue with that in the years to come as well. But uh, one question many have raised is that... Um, can TBMs be used for the excavation of tunnels in Norway? I think we have convinced people that the answer to that is yes. Yes. We have uh, just uh, excavated 18.5 uh, kilometers of the 20 kilometer long tunnel section at the Follow Line project. Uh, and um, we, uh, we used tunnel boring machines which were tailor made for the quite hard rock uh, conditions. So, and we also, uh, we also uh, uh, did uh, pre-grafting uh, of uh, approximately 7.5 kilometer of this 18.5 kilometer long. So, so uh, yes, uh, we, uh, this is possible, but uh, the machines has to be tailor-made for the ground conditions. And to be able to do that, you also need to have a good knowledge of the ground conditions. I think that was the last one. Thank you. Before we start, those standing up at the back, there are plenty of seats down in the hall if you want to come down now. You want to you, oh, somebody come, come, come on down. Don't be shy. Is it possible to be an engineer without being able to 
install this microphone on my tie. Oh, here it is. Okay. Yeah, it works. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, let me first of all just follow the chairman and say Happy New Year to all of you. Happy New Year to 2020. That will be an exciting year for, for you guys with Brexit and, and everything, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's approximately, it's a, it's a great honor to be here. It's approximately 10 years since last time I had the possibility to actually be here and to give a presentation to, to this audience. Do not let it be 10 years to the next time. Then I'm probably way out of business. Um, we were at the, um, at the Brunel Museum this morning. That was really, really interesting to see. And I think we got inspired to continue our works with respect to developing such as subsea tunnels. And by coincidence, I think that this little presentation tonight will be in the spirit of the father and son Brunel. I got the scope of presentation in this invitation from the uh, Secretary General of the Norwegian Tunneling Society. So I had the freedom to pick together the, th the stuff that I would like to present to you. So, I called it Tunnels, Water and Under the Sea. And I think that fits well with the spirit of Brunel, right? I would look at four different projects. I will take a look at Rogfast Tunnel, which is a road tunnel uh, between uh, Stavanger and Havgesund on the west coast of Norway. Uh, then I will look at an idea that we came up with some, some years ago, uh, where we developed a concept to make subsea tunnels to potential oil fields not at very large distance from the shore, but in the range of, let's say, 20, 30 kilometers or something like that, and in areas which were prone to environmental restrictions. Then, the Stad Ship Tunnel. The Stad Ship Tunnel is not a subsea tunnel at all, but it has to be in the sea somehow, since it is a ship tunnel. Then finally, I will look at, if time allows, I will look at tunnels for Hyperloop. You know, Hyperloop is going to enter into the market soon. And it's kind of going supersonic in subsea tunnels. That's basically the, uh, the content of my presentation tonight. I have to admit that some of these that you will see are, do not have any merits whatsoever. I'm sorry about that, but again, then, in the, in the spirit of Brunel, that may not necessarily be uh, a showstopper for the presentation. Um, some are concept tests that you will see. Uh, you will also see that I pick up where Anne Katrine left, the use of TBMs. Do we see the possibility of using TBMs for subsea tunnels going down to let's say 390 meters water depth. Yeah. Yeah, I heard that. <laughs> You're absolutely correct. Because could a TBM give some added value to a project like, like the Rogfast project? A value with respect to durability and constructability for the project. And these oil field tunnels, they are planned to be I don't think they will be ever constructed, but not for oil field purposes, but they were planned to be built using three, three TBMs in parallel. First of all, the, um, the Rogfast Tunnel Project. I will give you a short introduction to the project. The subsea tunnel is located between Stavanger and Havgesund, and this is along the coast along the coast where all the low pressure uh, weather uh, comes from the UK and swiping up along the coast 
and, and touching this area. The length of the tunnel is approximately 27 kilometers, and it's a part of the E39 that goes from Kristiansand in the, in the south to Trondheim, which is the brain capital of Norway. <laughs> it reaches the deepest point of 390 uh, meter under sea, and the cost estimate was at a certain point in time almost 17 billion Norwegian crowns. Today it has raised up to approximately 20 billion. It's a two time 10.5 meter width of, of tunnels. And I, yeah, we, can, we will see some of, the, uh, some of the details later on. The annual average daily traffic is only 13,000 vehicles. So it's not a very high density or high traffic tunnel. This is a longitudinal section that you see on top, and you see the plan on your right-hand side. It's built basically according, or it's planned to be built basically according to the Norwegian principles, a minimum rock cover of not less than 50 meters, with uh, probe drilling ahead of the tunnel face, and pre-excavation -excav pre grouting as the main, or the first uh, line of defense with respect to handling of water. Rock bolts, sprayed concrete linings, and an inner lining, a self-standing inner linings. You will see that this particular project has two low points, and it has an excess point in the, almost in the middle, which leads to a small island out in that area where the crossing is taking place. This is the island in the middle, um, this is the access to this island, with two low points here and here, and 5% inclination to both sides. So basically according to EU regulations. Um, some of this has been excavated. They have done a ventilation tunnel uh, on the north side, and a small transport tunnel on the south side. Uh, last year, the main part of it, which is actually this here, was tendered by the contractors. Uh, unfortunately, having had the, the tenders in-house and evaluated the tenders, the owner uh, decided to terminate the tender competition. So the tender competition was, was terminated, and these days, the owner is turning every stone to find possible ways to cut cost, to improve constructability, etc. And that is probably why we have just recently sent a technical uh, memo to the owner on again looking at the possibility of using TBMs. What they will do with the contracts themselves, I'm not sure. Uh, this is an access tunnel, approximately four kilometers long. Uh, there are two large ventilation shafts here, and the original contract included approximately 21 kilometers of tunnel in the middle part. These two other contracts, one here to the south, and this one to the north, is, they, are, they are of smaller size than, than the first one. Last year, the Rogue Fast Subsea Tunnel was actually ranked as number one as a strategic infrastructure project in Europe, in Eurasia and in the southern and eastern Mediterranean. So it's a very important, it's a very important project, uh, particularly for that area of, of Norway along the coast, as I said, from Kristiansand to Trondheim. So this, what you see in the middle of the picture, is the access tunnel. You have two large shaft here, shafts here, ventilation shafts. They were designed and planned to be built as, as shaft sinking. 250 meters, 10 meters diameter, shaft sinking, where there is probably a meter or so uh, 
from the top of the shaft and to the sea level. That is really a challenging uh, task to do. Then there, is a, there are two donuts here, which are intersections, and this is the part which was then uh, tendered last summer. On the Stavanger side, they have two ventilation shafts also, but they will be excavated using conventional race drilling, pilot and race drilling. The cross section, typical Norwegian cross section, T10.5. Um, they will be uh, signed for 110 kilometers per hour. And typically in Norway, we are trying to put, you know, all the telecommunication systems um, in dedicated ditches running parallel to the tunnel uh, excavation. That makes it very easy to construct and very easy to install. It will be a two tube. You see the two times uh, 3.5 meter uh, width of the uh, traffic area, lay bys or, or niches, very, very standard solution. What is not necessarily a standard is what they have planned to do with respect to taking away or trying to, to handle the monotony of driving in long tunnels. The iconic picture that you see on top on the right hand side is from the Lardal tunnel, which was the first one, first tunnel built with, with this kind of, 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 of equipment or, or installation to take the monotony away from the drivers. One in China next to, next to the city of Xi'an was built probably some 10 years ago with a slightly different solution maybe even more fancy than, than this one or, or this one. So, yeah, the Chinese can do it um, as well. The geology is not a very simple one either. There is uh, typically schist in the Stavanger area here. And in this area, we have plenty of subsea tunnels, probably three or four or something like that, built during the last 30 years, and, and two of them were actually open for traffic uh, last year. Then we are entering into more intrusive mafic and ultramafic uh, rocks in this area next to Kvitsø here. Then we are into greenstone and pillow and brekshire lavas before we are entering into the, into the uh, granitic to diuretic uh, uh, gneissic basement up north here. So it's not you know, anything in particular with respect to the geolo geology from rock types. But if we start to look at what is in this, we will see that this area is cut by fall zone in a large, large number. Going down from the Stavanger side, it's nice and easy. This is a walk in the park. This is something which has been done many, many times before in this area here. But when we are getting under the sea, you see all these red things here are representing low velocity zones or potential fault zones. This is the first one. They assess the rock cover to be approximately 60 to 65 meters. There is another low point here, but not that bad. And we see the traces of the interpreted fault zones on, on the plan up in the upper right-hand side picture. Then we can continue. This is the island of Kvitsøy. It's getting even worse. A large number of weak zones or fault zones, and it continues like this throughout the entire, entire tunnel length. So complicated, structural, geological conditions. If you look at the Q values, the Q values are derived from the seismic profiles using the velocities to calculate the, uh, the Q values. You will see that 10% of the length of this 
will actually be very poor or worse rock mass conditions. Approximately 10% will be poor, 60% will be fair, and 20% will be, be uh, good rock mass conditions. That, doesn't that does not necessarily tell the whole story because I would say that these fault zones are all more dominating to the, to the uh, constructability of the tunnel than the, uh, than the uh, Q value itself. So, uh, following a um, feasibility study, we were looking at the possibility of introducing TBM as a construction method. Well, this is just listing the challenging challenges that the expected geological conditions should give us along the tunnel alignment. I do not necessarily need to go through these or all these bullet points. But it ended up that if we should recommend a TBM to be uh, used for this, uh, this project, we ended up with a rather, what to say, not necessarily a standard TBM. We needed to have a kind of a mixed shield or dual mode TBM, which have combined capacities of an EPB TBM and a single or a double shield TBM. Probe drilling and pre-excavation grounding is mandatory, so the TBM needed to be equipped with the same possibility of doing probing ahead of the tunnel phase and pre-excavation grotting. We were looking at the possibility to have a combination of a, of a, uh, uh, a transport or conveyor belt and a screw conveyor, and the capability of switching boring mode from, from one mode to the other whilst in the tunnel, because as I said, the first part of the uh, the Stavanger side is a walk in the park, so you do not necessarily need to go with a, with a screw conveyor there. And yeah, this is really a little bit added on to a normal standard TBM that we have seen in Norwegian tunneling projects so far. We were looking at different combinations of TBMs for five, six, eight, and so on. And we evaluated all these combinations. We do not need to go into the details of this, but we looked at different options, different possibilities of utilizing TBM. So what, what did we conclude when we did the risk assessment? We concluded that a TBM is fit to deal with these changes in the geological conditions when we have the possibility of identifying them upfront, and when we have the possibility to actually take benefit of all the equipment that we bring on board on the TBM. If there is, as it's said here, if there is an uncontrolled cave-in or water ingress, that may cause more severe consequences when we are doing TBM tunneling compared to what would have happened if it was a conventional drill and blast. Yeah. So then we go to these oil field tunnels. To start, um, to start up a new oil field in the northern part of Norway is not very popular these days. Um, but we see that maybe such a concept could be used for all the purposes. We are making large windmill parks out in the ocean, for example, several hundred min windmills. Would it be a benefit for these if we have the possibility to make tons from the shore and to these windmills? Maybe we can, can collect all the cables from the windmills and take them to a tunnel to the onshore, for example. So maybe not necessarily looking at this kind of tunnels for only oil field uh, purposes, but try to look at it from, from other perspectives as well. So what we were looking at was an area located north of Vesterolen, and we see that we start in the basement, then we go into the continental shelf with sedimentary rock types. 
the water head here is approximately 150 meters, and we are approximately 100 meters below the sea floor. So the geological conditions in this area is basically consisting of shale, mudstone, sealstone, and sandstone, all Cretaceous age. These are some pictures of, of core samples. They were actually done for, for, the, for uh, oil uh, exploration uh, purposes. So the oil people are actually cutting uh, all the cores into two. Uh, I don't know for why, for what reason they are doing that, but this is what we, we found in the area. Not necessarily a nice view. So, we were looking at the possibility then to make a 4.5 kilometer long drill and blast tunnel from the, from the surface down to an assembly point where we put together the TBMs and then the TBMs go approximately 22 kilometers on a slight incline upwards towards a uh, cavern which is the exploration cavern. And the challenges that we see is very weak and unstable rock mass, stress-related problems like squeezing, etc., large water ingress, 250 meter of pressure, pre grouting is a mandatory thing here too, gas pockets is normally expected to, to occur in these areas, shallow gas, mixed phase conditions, and not least the fact that we have to run three TBMs in parallel, and they have to have the same high expected performance rates. So we made a calculation on time and cost, and we actually found that this concept is competitive with respect to time and cost with conventional, um, with conventional um, installations for oil uh, exploration and exploitation in, in, in the North Sea. TBM that we ended up with, uh, approximately seven meters in, in diameter, double shield, pa three parallel TBMs, and as it said, a standard TBM may not necessarily be ap applicable in these circumstances. Then, we go to the Stott ship tunnel. The Stott ship tunnel is planned to be located in the northwestern part of Norway, where actually the, the land mass is bending a little bit from almost straight north towards north, uh, northeast in this area. And this area is an area where there have been lots of, of capsizing and, and uh, disasters with, uh, with ships. The picture on, on the lower right-hand side shows a cruise ship that was almost ending up on the shore last year. Uh, it lost engine power and started to drift on its own and almost ended up on shore. They were able to restart the engines and, and, and managed to get out of the area. So this is a project where the Norwegian government has put aside approximately three billion Norwegian crowns for this project but the project has been uh, on the agenda for almost 15 years. And when this was published, it attracted a lot of, of people, a lot of articles were made, a lot of publications were done, and it was claimed that this was the first ship tunnel in the world. But looking a little bit into the history, I found that in France, there was actually a 160 meter long tunnel built in the 17th century. And for those of you who have seen the, the uh, movie or read the book uh, prepared by uh, Roald Dahl on, uh, on Willy Wonka and, and the chocolate factor or whatever the English uh, <laughs> title is, you see there's a tiny little ship tunnel there too. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a joke, there was a, there was a mother who, who went to the movies to see this movie 
Uh, and it's a kind of scary movie for, you know, for children. And after the movie, she asked her, her son or daughter, I can't remember, so what do you think? Did you like the, the tunnel? Did you get scared? And, and the child all, uh, answered that, no, because I was not in that tunnel. So, yeah, let's hope that we are able to make it more safe and better than this thing here. Uh, the architects were looking at really making this a big thing with respect to the entrances. And you can see, I mean, these are large, large cuts in the, in the, in the landscape. There's a ship here entering into the tunnel. And you can see also here on the other side, a little smaller, but still a large cut into the landscape. And a costly one. Very costly. It will be approximately 50 meters from bottom to the top, 36 or 37 meters in, in width, and 1,700 meters in length. Construction time, approximately three to four years. Uh, last year, there was a sort of a cost cutting exercise to see what could we do with respect to the cost for this project. And one of the things that we did was to try to get rid of the entrances in that way, for example. But we were also trying to gain more information from the geological circumstances. So this is approximately the tunnel alignment. We started to drill a 1,700 meters long uh, directional drilled core hole. One crew started here and another crew started on the other side. Unfortunately, halfway we went into trouble and we had to abandon the core hole. What kind of signal is that giving us? We give up a 48 millimeter core hole and we plan to build a 1600 square meter Ship tunnel. Yeah. The geological conditions are in general quite, quite okay. It's a banded gneiss with some ocean gneiss and some mica cheese. Mica cheese is not a, a good thing to have. And the Q values are quite okay. The horizontal stress component is, is quite favorable. We have approximately 7.3 megapascal acting on the side walls of the tunnel, which is really, really favorable with respect to the stability of the roof. This is the way one is planning to do the excavation itself. Starting with the top heading, going down, and having an access tunnel on the side of the main tunnel, which is then serving this upper part of it. Then, this will be done by vertical benches. Uh, and this is access and transport out of, of, of rock dump, rock muck. So, it, it is not necessarily a really complicated piece of work to do. But I think that in this type or this size of, of, of a project, the one who is actually mastering the logistics in this is actually going to be the winner because the logistics will be so important to be able to cut costs, cut cost and get up with a reasonable time schedule. Then finally, a few slides about a potential or, or a possible solution for a hyperloop between first of all Sweden and Finland. And this is an idea that a few guys who are actually living here in the Orland, came up with. You may ask, why do they come up with that kind of stupid idea? But it comes from this, 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 these people here. They would like to have less transport or less time of transport between Finland. You know, Orland is a part of Finland, but they love the, the Swedes and hate the Finns. They speak, they speak, they speak uh, Swedish and use Euro. But, um, 
So it's a kind of a mixed, uh, mixed thing. So we were looking at the possibility of crossing the, um, the, um, ah, the sea between Finland and, 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 uh, and Sweden with a subsea tunnel. Um, we, I have found that two guys, two, two, two Brits, actually came up with a solution with respect to how could we possibly you know, reduce the length of the excavation phases if we have a long subsea tunnel. I don't know if you know these two guys, Alan Sharp and Garrett Mainwaring. Are they familiar with you folks? Okay. Well, they came up with the idea together with Ola Wilson, which is a Norwegian consulting company, to use sort of oil platforms. Because, because these oil platforms are actually, there is actually shafts inside them so that you can go up and down. So by using these as shafts, starting with uh, excavation of a vertical shaft in the rock here, and then open up tunnel faces from a number of these platforms. Then you are able to actually cut the construction time significantly compared to going from one side. That would be, you know, killing. That would be absolutely a showstopper. But this is actually a possibility to, to you know, allow such, such project to be materialized. Anyway, the geological conditions between, between um, Åland and, and, and Sweden is not very well developed. We see that here between Åland and Finland is actually a number of major geological structures which is cutting through the landscape here. This is under the sea, of course, which needs to be negotiated with a tunnel. The, the, the sea depth here is not very big or not very large, something like 75 meters at the most, in average around 50 meters water depth. So we're not going to, very, we're not going to go very, very deep. And the rock mass is granitic. The distance between the shores along the tunnel alignment is approximately 170 kilometers, so it's going to be a really, really long subsea tunnel. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit over time, but I'm just a few slides back now. So how could we arrange a tunnel for hyper, hyperloop uh, tubes? We can put them two by two, like this. We can put three uh, tubes into a tunnel with approximately a 13 meter uh, width. We can use TBMs, for example, and we can put the, uh, the tubes into two parallel TBMs, one, one TBM which is divided in the middle. Have you been considered the possibility of evacuating a pod which is driving in, let's say, 700, 800, 1,000 kilometer per hour in a 170 kilometer long, long tunnel. Um, we had to, you know, come up with a solution. And this is something which has been developed by Sintef. It's not, very, it's not a very intelligent or very comprehensive solution that you see here, but you have the possibility to start and stop the pod you know, automatically. So if you, if you um, allow that either an evacuation tunnel is located in the middle, like it's here, and then you evacuate from the hyperloop tube and the pod through some, some closed, um, closed area here, where you have overpressure, for example, and then People just have to sit and wait until somebody is able to come and pick them up. And here we have an evacuation room instead of a tunnel. So these are just some, some simple solutions to how, how could we possibly evacuate people who are getting stranded in a hyperloop pod somewhere between Sweden and Finland. So this is the scope that I got that you see here. I hope that you have enjoyed a little bit of tunnel entertainment.
with respect to future things to come. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, let's have some um, questions. Remember, in, in giving your question, um, name and affiliation um, first, and then your question, please. First question. Front here. Uh, David Fawcett, independent consultant. Uh, I think Bane Nor have been using some uh, diff what we would regard as different and innovative conditions of contract on the folio line. And I just wondered if how that has, might affect the way tunnels are procured in future in Norway. Uh, uh, different kinds of contract which we have used or, or uh, uh, are you thinking of um, EPC uh, contracts or um, what's that? Both the type of contract and the conditions you've used, yes. Is that, I mean, has it, has it been satisfactory? And will it change the way you develop and procure contra tunneling contracts in the future? Um, earlier, we used to, to use uh, unit price contracts. Uh, uh, but um, uh, for the follow line project, for instance, we have uh, used uh, uh, an EPC uh, contract. Uh, for the tunnel excavation, uh, and uh, uh, we have also now just uh, uh, signed uh, two uh, new tunnel contracts, uh, which are also um, EPC uh, contracts. Um, it's a special uh, version of, uh, of the EPC uh, uh, format because um, it is uh, contracts which uh, we used to uh, use for um, yeah, contracts within the oil and gas industry. Uh, and um, NT NTK uh, is uh, the, the format. But the but, uh, main difference uh, between this uh, NTK and uh, uh, other kinds of um, uh, EPC contracts and also unit price contracts is that um, if uh, we have uh, uh, a claim with a contractor, we are actually, both parties are forced to solve it within um, a limited time, um, yeah, half a year, for instance. Uh, it depends, but uh, it's defined in the contract. Instead of uh, of uh, uh, waiting uh, until uh, we have finalized the job and then uh, collect all the the, the claims. Uh, 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 and in some cases, uh, years after they actually uh, appeared. So, so um, uh, we have um, we have uh, some experience regarding this now. And uh, due to my opinion, I think this works uh, in a good way because uh, then we uh, we are still uh, there in the in the project. If you if you wait until you have finalized uh, the people, they are uh, spread all over, and it's and you don't remember either. So, so um, to solve the problems uh, when they occur or within a limited period after they occur, I think that is uh, a good idea. But uh, another thing within this uh, concept is the risk sh sharing part of it. Uh, things that. Uh, that are known when we enter into the contract. That is the contractor's responsibility. But uh, things uh, which uh, are unexpected, which uh, um, turns out during the contract period, it can be ground conditions, for instance, what was identified, what was not identified when we entered into the contract, that 
has to be the client's uh, responsibility. So, yeah, we, we have uh, started, but uh, we will probably, for our projects uh, in the future, use a mix. Some projects will be done um, by unit price contracts. If you have complicated station projects, for instance, uh, maybe it's better to use uh, uh, unit price contracts, but uh, uh, for other projects, uh, we will probably use uh, the, um, the EPC contract formula. Okay, we've got another question, please. I'm going to start um, eliciting questions in a minute. We've got a big delegation from Heron Connect at the back there. We've got a question on TBMs. Yeah, he's probably busy writing his story back there. Must have some more questions from the floor. There we go, in the middle, Alan Thomas. Alan Thomas, uh, Alter Plan Consulting. Um, Anna Katarina, um, thanks for an excellent presentation. I was wondering, with the uh, Norwegian type of uh, EPC uh, contract, how much possibility is there for a contractor to propose new designs? Do you see opportunities for contractors to to offer new solutions on some of these complex projects? Uh, if you have an uh, EPC contract, uh, that should be uh, possible. But we have also now um, uh, the, the, the two contracts that we just uh, signed. Uh, was an uh, EPC contract, yes, but it was a contract where we uh, did a uh, kind of um, uh, negotiation with uh, uh, the contractors, uh, those who were nominated to take part in the last part of the co uh, competition. Uh, and uh, during uh, that period, it is, uh, of course, possible to, to come up with uh, new uh, solutions to, to propose uh, new methods, uh, and uh, within an EPC contract, it is the contractor who is responsible for, for the, um, the engineering. And um, uh, in uh, our contract, for, for instance, at the follow line project, yes, the contractor, he, uh, he came up with, uh, with the proposal of uh, changes uh, after we had signed the contract, uh, new solutions uh, for um, how to perform the project, and, uh, and then we uh, made some variation orders. Uh, the contract regulates uh, for that as well. It's possible. So any more questions? Ah, here we go. In the front. Warming up now. No. Hello, I'm Christina Smith from Tunneling Journal. Um, I wanted to ask you, you say that um, Drill and Blast is really well suited to your Norwegian rock and that it's safer in a lot of circumstances when there's faults or lots of water. So why are you both so keen to introduce tunnel <coughs> boring machines? <laughs> uh, yeah, I can answer that. I think that it's like that we have a toolbox. In our toolbox, we have different tools. And we have to learn what would the circumstances be to use the different toolbox. It doesn't really have to do with, let's say, a competition between one or the other. It's actually for the engineers to utilize the tools in the toolbox the best way to be able to produce the best project with the best time and cost results for the, you know, for the sake of the, uh, for the communities, because most projects are, or belongs to, you know, the communities and using the communities or, or governmental money or, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of actually having the possibility to use 
and to choose the right tool for any typical project because all projects are unique. I mean, how to take into account whenever we make a choice on excavation method that this uniqueness have to be taken into account. I can um, mention one example, for instance, uh, for the follow line project where we had the 20 kilometer long tunnel. Uh, at an early stage of that uh, project, we we uh, uh, made uh, some uh, studies uh, regarding excavation method, and uh, if we should have um, done the entire uh, excavation from we started with the pre-work, uh, excavating access tunnels until we had finalized the tunnel. Uh, excavation, if we should have done that uh, within a period of uh, approximately three and a half, uh, nearly four years, uh, in that area, it would have been uh, necessary to, to go in from uh, six or seven different access points, and many of those would have been uh, located within densely populated areas. Uh, then we saw that if we, if we could use tunnel boring machines, uh, we could uh, uh, we could go in from one uh, central located access point where we had access to a large rig area uh, located in an area. Yes, we have neighbors there, but, uh, but just few. Uh, and uh, we could uh, perform the tunnel excavation within uh, the same time from one access point instead of going in from six or seven. So, uh, yes, I, I think... Uh, uh, Earlier, it was we we we, we uh, 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 chose uh, drill and blast more or less automatically. But uh, uh, for future projects, I think it's important that we we actually actually do serious uh, considerations regarding uh, the methods, as you mentioned, Ivan, to to be aware of what you have uh, in your toolbox. Oh, now we're, um, Andy Flower Day here. Which, uh, oh, sorry, and then we. Thank you, uh, yeah, Andy Flower Day from Bar Hale. Um, I think we all appreciate you are experts in rock tunneling. My question is about the quick clay. Do you have many tunnels in the quick clay horizon? And if so, how is that approached? Uh, yes, we, we have uh, in the city of Oslo, we have tunnels uh, in, uh, which has been uh, built uh, through areas uh, where we have uh, quick clay or, uh, or where we are close to areas with quick clay. But we have not used uh, tunnel boring machines, for instance, to, uh, to go through those uh, uh, to, to build those, we have uh, we have built them as um, cut and cover constructions. But what we have seen is that uh, yes, we, we will probably still do that uh, in some of uh, our urban uh, projects. But uh, we also know that uh, uh, tunnel boring machines uh, today they uh, will probably also be able to to perform tunnels also within. Uh, uh, such ground conditions and uh, and uh, from the machines for instance or if we go in from uh, uh, from the surface uh, bef before we start the excavation to do uh, necessary uh, improvements of of the ground conditions uh, install chalk cement piles for instance thank you well, one one more question over there Rob that was it so no, right we we're, we're but uh, um, I'd, I'd, I'd like you to thank um, the, the speakers and, and the whole uh, delegation from um, the Norwegian Tunneling Society. I think you've inspired our own committee to think, where, where can we go off on a trip now? <laughs> uh, so perhaps if you give a, a very big cheer for the Norwegian Tunneling Society. And if I could have the chair slides now, please. <laughs> so I'll, 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 uh, th there's rather a lot to get through, and I'll, uh, apologies to anybody, I'm going to skip through them pretty quickly. 
Um, for the first uh, social of, 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 of the year, um, British Tunneling Society, young members, Thursday, the 30th of January, 5 o'clock onwards. If you're any good at darts or drinking, uh, which probably <laughs> most of you are, um, the sheaf in London Bridge. Um, next meeting, um, a good lead in to um, Valentine's Day, um, 13th of February, uh, um, on West Cumbria Mining Project. Mark um, Kirkbride, former BTS committee member and a fellow of IEMM, will present an interesting and stimulating um, paper. Um, uh, well, I'll let you read the rest on, on the website because we, we, we need to get down to the bar. Um, 20th of February, um, David Hindle, Tunnel Maintenance, Improvement and Repair, um, young members um, in the Tel Telford Theatre here. Key dates now just running through. 4th of March, um, the young members are holding a workshop on uh, construction um, chemicals delivered by Normat at Warwick um, University. Um, and then our own Charles Allen is running a workshop. Um, did you know about that, Charles? Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Well, you, you, you're, on, you're on at 14.30 uh, all afternoon, Charles. Um, and uh, if, uh, if, you, if you manage to survive um, an afternoon of Charles, you've got um, uh, an evening meeting on uh, the fire, fire performance of tunnel linings um, given by um, Tom Lennon. And uh, just so as you know, uh, John Corcoran has in, included a, a, a Eureka curve, which presumably he knows what it is, we don't. Um, young Members uh, Conference, 13th of March. Um, call for presentations, now open. And call for sponsors, please. Um, another um, talk, 2nd of April, ventilation, Telford Theatre, young members. Um, and a reminder um, to log on to our YouTube channel, um, Google BTS YouTube, um, it's all there. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, now, do you want to be a Billy No Mates? Um, our our um, 50th anniversary book um, is, is gaining momentum. Um, you don't want to be the uh, ancient tunneler sat outside the wedding feast kicking yourself because you haven't written a story. Um, in December, we, 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 we called for um, uh, stories. Um, at that time, we felt we could, with the stories we'd been provided, we could pr probably produce a pamphlet. Um, <laughs> we're, now, we're now into the, um, into the booklet stage. We've, we've had a hell of a push during the month. Um, but the booklet is still rather far short of um, the target of a book. Um, there are, uh, now Ken has provided a number of pie charts here that I'll attempt to explain. Um, there are, there are uh, Ken, Ken tells me there are um, 650 um, BTS members. There are, there are actually 810, Ken. Um, but we've only received 62 stories, so um, I'll work out the percentage of members. Not good. And we're going to start naming and shaming next month. Um, we've already shaming Dickie Dexter up there, who's <laughs> promised to write a story. He, he tells me he's a bit short of anecdotes. None of us believe it. Um, uh, some more, some more part, pie charts um, provided from Ken. Um, but but the, the, the message here is that... Um, uh, in, uh, between December and January, we, we received an additional 26 stories. So the nagging and, 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 and pecking away is having some, some, uh, some fruition, but we've got a long way to go. Um, but we are now at that critical um, stage. Uh, we've reached a critical momentum of 66 stories, so a third of the way through. And all you TBM tunnelers will know it's always the first th third that's the difficult bit. And then Ken's got a program there, but I, d I don't know. I, I'm a contractor. I don't understand programs. <laughs> um, so if you don't, uh, so um, yes. Now, the sausage, the sausage. We've decided to um, provide an extension of program to the sausage, to the end of January. If you write a story by the end of January, you will receive a sausage voucher. 
which entitles you to an extra sausage in your evening meal. So there it is, Ken's provided a drawing of that sausage. So there it is, write your story, submit it by the end of January, and you will get a sausage voucher. It'll be in your own name and signed by me. <laughs> what, what, but Ken reminds us it's only while stocks last. So here's some examples. You've seen these all before. Good and bad days. I mean, a lot of, uh, 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 it seems you, everybody's coming up and saying, what, what do you want to tell us about? Well, what, what do you tell us about at the bar? Funny tales, how times have changed. We've had, we had an excellent uh, story from um, Helen Natras uh, uh, and her school of belly dancing. I'll leave the rest to you. Um, photographs in particular, but photographs with stories and uh, uh, letting us know um, ab about the photograph and who's in it. <clears throat> and again, there's um, Ken's um, sausage voucher. Um, so it's on the website. Uh, you'll, you'll find the sausage um, on the website there. Ken's picked it up. Um, and and if, if, if we haven't got the message across, speak to um, Ken Spivey there, John Corcoran here, Sarah Langley. Where's Sarah? Sarah, Sarah at the back there, or, or me. Um, and uh, let, let's get this book... Um, going because we, we, we really have um, reached the point of no return now. Um, turning more seriously, um, we, in, in, in April, um, we're st starting our next cohort of apprentices um, and um, we are looking for um, 16 apprentices. Um, if, you, if you have ideas, um, please see um, Rod Young or Roger Bridge in the bar tonight. Um, the, our tunnelling course in the summer runs from the 6th of July to the 10th of July. Um, booking is not quite open yet. Um, costs for um, members, uh, BTS members, are um, for the week, including accommodation, £1,485, so a bargain. And I'm not going to tell you the non-members rate because um, uh, it, it's a lot more expensive. Why wouldn't you become a member if you wanted to go on this course? Um, BTS dinner. Um, th this, uh, again, I have to remind you, um, we've had a change in the date um, because of the um, change in bank holidays in May. Um, the date this year will be um, Friday the 1st of May um, 2020. Cost £130. For retired members, £65. And as last year, um, for the Billy No Mates, um, the singles, um, there's no need uh, now to go on to Bumble uh, and join Sharon Stone in dating. Um, you can come along um, to the BTS dinner as a single um, because we are running singles tables that will be hosted um, by BTS. Um, and was very successful last year. And we'll be doing it again this year. So you don't need to be on a corporate table. Um, we have a podcast now up and live. Um, first episode of the new podcast. Um, uh, if you want to know uh, what a podcast is or how to get a podcast, is John Young here? John Young over there will be at the bar demonstrating how to find a podcast on your portable telephone. It's quite easy, he tells me. <laughs> I haven't been able to do it, but a number of members of the committee were able to do it. <laughs> and, and finally, um, I'd like to um, thank uh, the Norwegian Tunnelling Society um, once again, but on, on this occasion for sponsoring the bar tonight. Um, we'll, we'll, be, uh, we'll be making the most of your hospitality. <laughs> um, and um, I'd like to thank um, BASF um, for sponsoring the food. Um, Richard Ford is where's R Richard Ford is here. Um, if you want to buy any chemicals tonight, <laughs> Richard is your man. Um, and um, if you're lucky, I think he, he, he has a couple of barrels of tailskin tail skin grease in the boot of his car. So not only will you get a chemical, you'll also get a barrel of uh, tailskin um, uh, grease. But at that, um, the bar is open. Thank you. <laughs>